out. Here we go. And then let me share my screen. Which one? This one. Okay, just a quick feedback. Do you see my mouse running around the page? Yeah, I can see it. Thank you very much. Then I can use it. So, okay. So this is about uh, modeling of sea turtles. Now, this is not just one paper. This is really a story uh, developed over several years and several papers. And it's a really cool story, I find. And uh, this work is done with my good friend and year-long collaborator, Kevin Painter. He is at the University of Torino in Italy. And he is the person where I have written most of my papers with. So I think maybe we have like more than 20 uh, co-authored papers together. So what's the thing? So the, the question is, um, at the coast of Brazil, there lives a, a sea turtle population, Colinias Midas. And uh, the female turtles, when they want to lay their eggs, they swim out into the open Atlantic Ocean to find a tiny island, which is called Ascension Island. And then in the sand of Ascension Island, they bury their eggs. And then eventually the eggs hatch and the little turtlings come out. And then millions of little turtles uh, find their way into the water, into the ocean. And then, of course, while this happens, there are lots of seabirds and they're, they're uh, pr uh, uh, predating on the little turtles. And then in the water, they're welcomed by little uh, by sharks and barracudas and what have you. So um, it's also a, a a food feast for some of the predators. But uh, our interest or my interest is uh, the orientation. So we have these uh, turtles, sea turtles at the coast of Brazil, and they need to find this super tiny speck of an island, which is 2000 kilometers away. And the question is, how do they do this? Okay. So uh, here we go. Here is, uh, here is a beautiful image of one of these turtles. And uh, here is Ascension Island. So you see me uh, in front of a world map. So on the left, we have Brazil. On the right, we have Africa. Uh, here is the coast of Brazil, where I'm pointing with my pointer where the sea turtles live. But then they swim out to Ascension Island. This is where I put my finger. And uh, you might not be able to see it. <laughs> So let's enlarge. And so now if you look carefully, you can see it. Uh, so let me enlarge a bit more. So maybe now you can see the little speck of island right there. Okay. So this is, uh, let's go back. So then this is the distance they have to travel. And this is the island they have to find. And uh, there's nothing else. So the Ascension Island is about 10 kilometers across. Um, the next island is 1,300 kilometers away, is St. Helena. So there's really nothing, no marking uh, uh, event or something. And in this map, it is somewhere here. Uh, and this year, in our simulation then later, we take a, a section of 100 kilometers across around the island to, uh, to then do our modeling of the turtle movement. And it's not only that the turtle needs to come from here to here, it is also the Atlantic Ocean, right? It moves. It is ocean water, the eddies, their storms, it's water. So um, there are certainly no roads which you can use for orientation. So the question is, how do the turtle manage to do that? And this is actually an old problem. So Charles Darwin wrote in 1873, even if we grant to animals a sense of the points of the compass, of which there is no evidence, how can we account, for instance, for the turtles which formerly congregate in multitudes only at one season of the year on the shores of the Isle of Ascension, finding their way to that speck of land in the midst of the great Atlantic Ocean? So in effect, we are answering a question which was raised by Charles Darwin. Isn't that cool? I think this is super cool. All right, so migration, uh, of course, we, we know a lot about migrating animals, right? We know birds migrate north and south, depending on the seasons. We know whales migrate uh, through the oceans as well. And then here in the middle, you see a rotating migration of, of turtles. This is a different uh, type of uh, sea turtle, which migrates in the Northern Atlantic gyre. It's called the Northern Atlantic gyre. Okay, so we are here 
this is not indicated on this graphic, but uh, but of course there are many many uh, uh, animals which do these kind of migrations. Okay. So here's what I like to do. Um, first, I talk about movement in oriented environments. So there, there must be a cue. There must be something which guides the turtles to the island. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. But even if we know what the cue is, the, the other question is how precise does it have to be? I mean, imagine uh, I put Nigga and Alexandra in a little boat off the coast of Brazil, and I give them an old compass, and I say, here, find Ascension Island. <laughs> So um, nothing against your abilities, but you would probably never make it. So uh, how precise does it have to be? Does it have to be precise like a missile or something? So, uh, so that's a, a secondary question. To answer this, I'm going to use the von Mises distribution. Uh, some of my students have worked with von Mises distribution before. So uh, this is the major player here. And to explain the use of von Mises, I detour, make a detour to wolf movement. Uh, the wolf movement problem is an interesting problem, which is relevant for Alberta, and uh, it is somehow easier to understand. So I, I like to explain the method on the wolf problem, and then if we understand this well, we go to the uh, back to the sea turtle problem. Okay, uh, there are other applications, so I use this a lot here on the right for brain tumor modeling, um, or for melanoma modeling, so for cancer modeling, we have used these models as well. But I will not talk about that in this talk. Okay. So the key idea is that the environment gives the species uh, some orientation. The environment tells you, you better go this way and you don't go the other way. And how could this information look like? Well, I, I parameterize this information by a direction vector, theta. So theta is a unit vector and, and this symbolizes direction. Go north, not south, or go east, not west, and so on. And uh, these directional informations can be unidirectional, uh, could be undirected, sorry, or directed. So undirected means like a road where you can go up or down, and there's no preference going up or down the road. Directed means uh, there is a preference. So this could be uh, like an electric field from plus to minus, uh, forward, backward, and so on, or flow of a, of a river, up river, down river, okay? So it could be directed or undirected. And then this information is uh, covered by a directional distribution function, Q. So Q changes in time, changes in space, and gives you the, the directional distribution of all directions. And as a distribution, it has to integrate to one. So then Q of theta means it is a probability to find the direction theta in your environment, okay? So if you think of, I don't know, nerve fibers, glioma cells go along nerve fibers. So if you have like three fibers going this way, then the probability going this way is higher than in any other direction. So this Q plays a central role in all the math, and this is what is given by the environment. So somehow we need to find ways to model this from the environment, which we observe. Now, this Q is uh, integrated to one, so it's normalized. But then we combine this, or we compare this to the movement velocity of the turtle, say, and uh, they have certain speeds. So then I combine all possible velocities into the set big V, and there's a range of speeds, S1, S2, uh, and can have any direction, okay? And then V hat is a unit vector corresponding to this uh, velocity vector. And then I lift the distribution Q onto a distribution on the larger set V, okay? So Sn minus one is all directions, V is speed times direction. So this is a different space. But I can make Q a distribution on V by dividing by a certain scaling parameter omega, which is here. Uh, and then Q over omega is a distribution on the set V. Q itself is a distribution on Sn minus one. Uh, this is a little detail, um, but this omega will show up in the formulas all the time. And so now, now you know where it is. Uh, can be computed, so it's, it's really not nothing complicated, uh, but that's what it is. Okay. 
And so now I use a transport equation to describe the movement. And this is where we get our connection to our course on hyperbolic conservation laws. Uh, we, we saw that the hyperbolic conservation laws support shocks and rarefaction waves. And essentially these are transport uh, processes. And this is exactly what we want to use here. So P is the uh, cell distribution at time T space X and velocity V. And then it satisfies this equation. Then, ooh, what is this? So yeah, let me work you through this very carefully. Uh, for the moment, assume the right-hand side is zero. So all this mu stuff here is, is zero, okay? Let's just put a big zero here on the right. Then the left is a conservation law. So we have a time derivative and we have a spatial derivative of first order equals zero. So this is analog to what we did uh, in class uh, over this uh, course. However, one difference is uh, in class, we used one X derivative, PX. And here we use a gradient. And we use a gradient because we are spatially in higher dimension. So the sea turtle move in 2D over the, uh, on the surface of the ocean, or maybe even 3D if we include uh, diving events or so. Uh, so, so turtle live in two or three dimensions. Uh, in our course, we only did spatially one dimension. So that's a big difference, of course. But uh, the idea is the same. And V is a velocity. So then this together is a directional derivative of P in direction of V. That's another way to see that. And if you say zero on the right, it describes constant movement along velocity V, just constant ballistic movement. Yeah, but the turtle don't move ballistically, they change direction and the change of direction is modeled here on the right. Okay, so how does this work? Now the mu is the turning rate. So if a turtle has velocity V, it changes its velocity with a rate mu. So maybe, I don't know, once every 30 seconds, it changes direction. And then it chooses a new direction given from this Q, given from the environment. Okay, so if the environment say you, you're most likely to go this direction, then this is chosen by the this distribution Q over omega. So then this integral term V prime is the incoming velocity, V is the outgoing velocity chosen with this probability Q over omega. Okay. So now um, one detail here this integral is on V prime, which shows up here, but not here. V hat is a unit vector of V, but not V prime. So this Q over omega and take out of the out of the integral. And then I have mu times Q over omega times the integral of P. And the integral of P I call P bar, like here. And then this uh, scary transport equation from the previous page looks a little bit simpler although it's exactly the equivalent thing. There's still an integral hiding here, okay? So that's the model. Now, the environment I told you is encoded in this Q. And for the ocean, for example, the flow field changes over time. So then if Q changes over time, we need a differential equation for Q, which is some function G of VQ and P as well. So then we can couple the transport equation 2A equation for the flow field or for the, uh, for the directional field. And then if the species reproduce, we also can add a reaction term plus F uh, to this equation. But that doesn't matter for the sea turtles because they reproduce once they are at the island and not before. So we don't need the F in this talk. Okay. So back to this equation, even though it is uh, cutely written in a compact form, it is still a rather complicated thing. And uh, I have worked a lot on this type of model and also on simplifications. And uh, Kevin and I have thought that, that maybe we should simplify it first before we apply this to the sea turtles. Uh, best would be to find a reaction diffusion equation, which we can use. Um, and so this is an happening here. I think I just need to blow my nose. So give me a moment.
Okie dokie. So where are we? Um, so here on the top, uh, I wrote kinetic model or transport equation. So this is where we are now. That's the equation from the previous page. And here I say parabolic limit diffusion equation. This is where I like to go. And the reason is the parabolic limit diffusion equation is much easier to handle than the kinetic transport model. And now uh, going through the literature, there are actually several methods to do that. Um, there is a parabolic scaling, which directly gets you here. There's a hyperbolic scaling, which gets you to a hyperbolic limit drift diffusion equation. Uh, and then you do diffusion dominance to get there, or you can do a moment closure, get balance equations and do fast momentum relaxation, blah, 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 and get also to the parabolic limit. For us, uh, for our course, we were in the hyperbolic regime, right? This is what our course is about. So to relate back to our course material, we would actually use a hyperbolic scaling and then look at the diffusion dominated case. But let me show you all three ways. So, so for all three of them, well, you can imagine there's a mathematical theory behind those, but uh, I show you one slide each, okay? So just one slide each to, uh, to kind of give you the idea of uh, how these scalings work. Okay, let's start here with the hyperbolic scaling. So hyperbolic is the middle one here. So we introduce macroscopic time and space scales. So time is now tau, <clears throat> which is epsilon times t, epsilon is small, c is epsilon x, epsilon is small. And if you transform the uh, transport equation, you get epsilons in the time derivative term and the spatial derivative term, whereas the right-hand side is unchanged, which I now call L. You don't have to call this L, but okay. So you get epsilons here, and you can do a singular expansion, which is called a chapman enskog expansion. It has a special name here because it is so famous. Okay. And if you do this, then uh, everything trickles down to a very simple hyperbolic system where you now you do have a zero on the right. And then this is transport in direction of VQ. This is transport in direction of a velocity VQ. And what is VQ? VQ is the average velocity of Q over omega. <clears throat> so Q was the uh, directional distribution of your environment. So then this is the average direction of your environment which means in the hyperbolic scaling, the particles fall the average direction of the environment. And so this makes actually a lot of sense. I think I wrote it in, in words here. So the drift velocity is a mean value of Q over omega over V. So this makes a lot of sense. And this is what, what you would expect, I hope. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you have undirected orientation like I said, a road where it can go up or down either way, um, then this integral integrates out to zero. And so then you have no preferred direction because you can go up or down uh, either way. Okay. In the parabolic scaling though, you, you scale time a little bit differently. You scale it by epsilon square. In space, you keep the same. This means you get an epsilon square here in the time derivative and uh, then you do an expansion in epsilon, which is now called a regular expansion in epsilon. I didn't make up these names, so this is a literature. Um, okay. And what you get in this case is a diffusion model. You get a diffusion model where you have two derivatives here. So it's something like Laplace D of P, where D is a diffusion constant, but it's not a constant now. Diffusion thing is a tensor, it's a matrix. And this matrix is the matrix by integrating Q over omega with uh, V and V transpose. So there's a lot going on. So let's look at this carefully. So V is a vector, V transpose is a transport vector. So V, V transpose is a dyadic product. So this is a matrix, okay? And then this matrix is integrated with the distribution Q over omega. So then together it's still a matrix. So DQ is a matrix putting in here. Um, and this also has a name, this is called the variance covariance matrix of Q over omega. Here we go. So the variance covariance matrix of Q. So the variance gives us a diffusion and the mean value gives us a drift. This is super cool. 
If you do the moment closure, this was the, uh, the third branch in my picture before, you actually get both terms together. You get the uh, drift term VQ and the diffusion term DQ. And this leads us then uh, to the procedure. So this thing in the box, which I call procedure, is now what I'm going to use for the sea turtles and for the wolf and what I've used for brain tumor modeling as well. So we define Q, this directional information from biological insight. So whatever imaging we have, we can define Q. And once we did this, we compute this VQ, the drift velocity, and DQ, the diffusion tensor, by these formulas. And that's it. And then we use this model here to describe our sea turtle population. Well, okay, so here in the procedure, this sounds easy enough, but maybe it isn't so. I mean, you, you need to compute these moments, right? Uh, and this might not be too easy to do. So we will see. Okay, but the idea is once we know what Q is, then we can just put it together and, and use it. All right. So well, how the F do we find Q? Well, the answer is von Mises. So von Mises distribution is a great tool to work with, and I tell you everything about it right now. Um, there are millions of other choices for Q, right? You can use other distributions, like I think Alexandra is thinking about Bingham distribution and Kent distribution, and uh, there's I think there's a radial symmetric Cauchy distribution, whatever. But von Mises turns out to be useful, so we use that. So here's von Mises. <clears throat> von Mises distribution is a distribution on directions, okay? Actually, I wanna show the picture too. So in two dimensions, you can envision this to be a circle. The circle symbolizes every direction. And then on the circle, you have this distribution in blue. So which means this direction here is the most likely direction to take, okay? But then there is some variance around it. But the opposite direction would be very low probability to take. So that's how the von Mises looks like. Here's the formula. So in the formula, gamma is a given direction. So there would be where the maximum is, this would be gamma. Uh, theta is our variable in the function. And then there's a concentration parameter k, which might be spatially dependent. And then this thing here with the Bessel function i0 is just a normalization. But we want q integrating to one, so then we need like a normalization constant in front, so that entire thing integrates to one. Good. Now, as k goes to zero, if k goes to zero, we get e to the zero, which is one. So we just have a constant, which turns out to be one over two pi. And that is a uniform distribution. It would be just uniform here. If k goes to infinity, uh, we get a singularity here, and this becomes a delta distribution. So we get concentration on one direction only. Okay. Also, the von Mises distribution is uh, the normal distribution wrapped around the circle. So it, it has the same approach like the normal distribution. I mean, you know, if you do statistics, you assume all the time something is normally distributed. And so, uh, so that's another good reason to use von Mises here. Okay. Yeah, recall. So we get, we get a formula for this Q, okay? Exponential of something. So if we integrate this with V, we get the drift velocity. If we integrate this with this tensor here, with this matrix, uh, we get the diffusion tensor. And we can do this. So these are formulas which are known. Uh, the drift velocity is in direction gamma with some Bessel function stuff in front. The diffusion term has an isotropic part and a directional part uh, with some Bessel function stuff in there. So these Bessel functions look a bit scary, but they're not. Uh, every program like MATLAB or Maple or something, they can do Bessel functions just fine. So uh, it's important that we can find explicit expressions for these terms. It's nice. Actually, often in the literature, people assume there is a constant times the identity and another constant times this dyadic product uh, without knowing what the Ds are. So with, with our work, we could actually identify this D1 and D2. All right, let me show you how this works. Here's an example, a made up example. 
uh, here we go. So we have this uh, two-dimensional domain. In the middle, we have strong orientation in the upper diagonal direction. Uh, on the outskirts, we have very weak orientation. So then here in the middle, von Mises looks like this. We get like a normal distribution with a peak at pi quarters. Uh, otherwise, it is relatively low. Now, if we solve our uh, partial differential equation, it's here on the right in B, actually. So now we solve this model. We compute VQ, DQ from the previous slides. We put it in. We solve it. We get this solution. So particles are moved out of this region. Dark blue is, is almost zero. And moved into this region uh, along the diagonal where uh, red is high concentration. So we get a high concentration peak here. And then particles continue moving about uh, from high to low, from high to low, and so on. Okay, so it makes a lot of sense. So they're pushed in diagonal direction, like the like the anisotropy arrows here indicate. Very nice. Uh, here on the left uh, is actually the original model, the kinetic model, but right? the one before I did all the scaling argumentation. So we solved this as well, just to be able to compare. And uh, we do get the same. It's just, it's just identical. Okay. Uh, relevant also for us is the bimodal von Mises. The bimodal von Mises distribution has two directions. It has plus gamma and minus gamma. So this would be the undirected case. You get two exponential terms with plus and minus. Uh, the constant changes were to uh, a quarter here. And, and then this is a distribution. In this case, the drift velocity is zero. The diffusion coefficient has a slightly simpler form. And then we can do the same test. Now we have um, non-oriented fibers, so we can go up or down the diagonal in the middle. The von Mises has two peaks, like it should. And then the solution, look, look at the last picture here. Uh, They're pushed in diagonal direction, but equally up or down. So you get maxima here and here, and you get minima here and here. And then these other pictures are the parabolic uh, limit, uh, which then uh, shows very similar uh, uh, results. Good. A little note on the side, this was for 2D. For 3D, things become much more complicated. And uh, the von Mises distribution in 3D is called Fischer distribution. I don't know why. It has a little bit different formula because of the normalization constant. And the uh, variance covariance matrix was unknown until we did this in 2017. So then we can also find, uh, okay, here I call it expectation, but this is the drift velocity. The variance is the uh, diffusion coefficient. So we can find formulas for these two. All right. So let's use this for the Wolf movement. Uh -huh. All right, so this has an interesting story as well. I'm just looking at my clock, but I think I'm good. So I was, um, from 2009 to 2014, I was associate chair graduate in my department, so graduate chair. And uh, yeah, most of you know our department. We have this, this region in the department where there are the secretaries and some of the offices, and I had an office there as well. And uh, when I came in one morning, there was an elderly person talking to one of the secretaries, but I just walked past and went into my office and, and did my thing, but I, I left the doors open. And then I heard that the discussion between this man and our secretary become louder and louder and more agitated. And, uh, and, and then I heard this guy saying something like, this is impossible and why can nobody help me? And I came extra and I drove four hours. And, and so he got really, uh, angry. So I thought, okay, I better go and rescue the secretary. And I went out and I, I said, yeah, hi, and uh, can I help you? And what's going on? And um, yeah, and he wouldn't calm down so easily. So I got him into my office, uh, set him down. And then, uh, and then he started to talk. And he talked, uh, he explained exactly this problem to me. So the problem is, um, he was a lawyer representing native people in northern Alberta and the oil exploration companies they would uh, cut 
uh, straight lines through the forest. And so here on the right, you see a picture of some forest. And if you look carefully, you can make out thin uh, straight lines which are cut through the forest. And these lines, along these lines, every 200 meters, they put an explosion in the ground uh, and a detonation, and they measure the seismic resonance of this explosion. So these are called seismic lines. And they do this, of course, to find oil, oil or gas. Okay, so then the entire forest eventually is crisscrossed by these seismic lines. But then the wolf can use these lines. They can use these lines to wander about. And uh, then they have an easier time to find caribou or to find deer, uh, 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 their prey. And this has, as a consequence, the prey population goes down. And the native people, they need the, uh, uh, these prey populations for their own hunting. Uh, and they couldn't find them anymore because uh, they were all eaten by the wolf. So then this uh, seismic line seems to have a direct impact on the balance between natural pre uh, predator prey behavior in these Northern Alberta environments. So he explained all this to me. Uh, and then he said, uh, yeah, we would like to support uh, uh, some research. Um, maybe we can find smarter ways to design these lines so that the disturbance of the forest is, is not as bad. And I said to him, well, yeah, well, this is a great idea. I'm sure we can do something. And then I explained to him how this works. So we could maybe have a master's student there would be two years. And for the master's student, we need about 20K per year. Uh, and then he looked at me and said, no, this takes too long. And then he left. <laughs> so that was that. And he didn't leave his name. This was an unfortunate thing. He didn't leave, leave a card or his name or nothing. He just disappeared. He was angry. Um, but I thought, anyways, it's a cool problem. So let's try that. So, so here we go. So this was 2000, I don't know, maybe 2011 or so. And uh, yeah, and so now we have 24, so it's 13 years later. Anyways, so it took a while. Um, but Mackenzie published a paper in the same year, at least. We published in 2014. Good. So here is the, um, the image, a picture, a picture of these seismic lines. Yeah, and so we digitized this. And so then these are all the lines on the same picture. So this is, uh, this is many more than you maybe would see in your first view, right? So if you look careful, then there are actually many more. It's the same, the same square. We didn't uh, uh, modify it. So same square, these are all the lines. Okay, um, let's see. And now we assume that on the lines, wolf are more likely to stay on the line and go up or down. But they can also go off the line into the black, which is a forest, and uh, just do a random walk in the forest until they hit the next line. And then they go up and down a little bit until they hit the forest again. And a good way to describe this, this was done by Mackenzie and Lewis, is ta-da, the von Mises distribution. Okay, so here's a formula for von Mises distribution again. The seismic lines have up or down, right? A wolf can go up or down equal either way. Um, and then gamma would be the orientation of the seismic line. And this we can measure, right? We have a picture. We can go there. We can measure the direction. So we know the gammas. We can put it in here. We know the concentration parameter K from uh, Mackenzie's work as well for the wolf. So we can put it in. We can compute our VQ and our DQ and solve our model. So this happens, I think. Well, yeah, this happens here. So then here, initially, we assume the wolf population is uniform everywhere. And then after a short time, T is 10, we find that wolf congregate on the lines. So this is now the solution of the PDE, okay, on this environment. So they congregate on the line, but they're also in the forest. The density in the forest is one. On the line is double, it's about two. But, but there's no blue patches, okay? So they're not leaving the forest entirely. It's kind of an equilibrium between the uh, lines and the forest, which uh, establishes. But also there's a preference to use the lines for sure. So then we looked at if we have a dense side of the wolf in the middle of the domain, how far do they spread out for hunting? And so then here's an image that after five days, they would uh, go this far. 
And then you see the effect of these seismic lines. So they reach further out, right? The light blue here goes further than the light blue in this ring, which would be without any lines. They would maybe stay here. With lines, they get further out. And of course, then they can increase their hunting success. Yeah, so this describes this problem really well. Um, in addition, though, deer also like these seismic lines because uh, there's usually fresh grass or fre fresh growth uh, for foraging. So they hang out these lines also preferably. And then the wolves show up and eat them and uh, catch them. All right. So back to the sea turtle. There it is. Uh, here's Ascension Island, and now I overlay the uh, geomagnetic lines. Um, uh, and the important information is the inclination. I don't know if, uh, if you ever thought about geomagnetic lines, but they have a certain inclination how they hit the earth or how they hit the water. And I think it is this angle which uh, the turtle then actually use for their orientation. Now, Charles Darwin said there's no indication of a compass in a turtle, but actually there is now. So it is known that turtle orient or use magnetic information for orientation. And even the organ is identified where there are uh, iron uh, ions inside a certain organ, which are then moved around depending on the magnetic field. Uh, and this can be measured. For example, here is a setup where this can be measured. Uh, you have a little basin filled with water and a little turtle, which is tethered to a measuring device and then surrounded by, an, uh, by a cage. And within this cage, you can set up uh, magnetic fields. And then you can measure how the turtle orientation changes as you change the magnetic field. OK, so this, this is an experiment which is done. Another cool experiment which has been done uh, uh, is uh, following, actually, turtle movement. So how would you do this at least like, I don't know, 50 years ago? So people would tether balloons on these turtles. So these are all turtles. Uh, this is on Ascension Island. And they tethered them when the turtle have laid their eggs and swim back to Brazil. Um, OK. And, uh, and so then you go on your boat and you just follow the, the red balloons over the ocean. It must have been absolutely a blast to do that. And then, I don't know, every hour or so, you record the location. This is fun. So then, then you get data of this sort. So here is again the North Atlantic gyre, where a different turtle population lives. And then at these black dots, uh, people did measurements of the orientation of the movement. And so here at the West Atlantic near Puerto Rico, they found orientations predominantly in the Northeast direction. Right? So here each black dot is an orientation of one of the turtles and more go to the top right and less go to the bottom left. At this dot here in the Eastern Atlantic, it's the opposite. Most turtles go to the uh, low, low left. So what is this? Southwest and not so much to the Northeast. Yeah, but what this is, this is a von Mises distribution, right? This is a distribution of directions on the circle. So you can kind of fit a normal distribution around, which has a maximum somewhere here, and then teeters off somewhere here. Or same here. It's like a normal distribution teetering off here and here. So these are von Mises distributions. These are parameterized von Mises distributions. Awesome. We are in business. We can do that. Yeah, nowadays, of course, people use GPS tracking. So here, a GPS device is attached to a turtle. Nowadays, they're even smaller than this. Uh, and then you get very detailed tracks. Not only do you get the swimming direction, you also get a death when they go down for foraging, right? Um, and come to the surface, etc. You also see in this image that the direction is more or less constant, right? So the, uh, the diving events, they do not seem to disturb the uh, overall direction. So that's why we argue we can get away with the two-dimensional simulation, um, because these diving events, they don't matter too much, or they don't change the direction. Yeah. OK. So then here's one example of measured turtle tracks. Um, and again, they measured 
starting from Ascension Island, going back to Brazil. The reason is that uh, if you meet a turtle on Ascension Island, a mother turtle, you know where it's going to go. It's going to go back to Brazil. If you meet a turtle at the coast of Brazil, you just don't know if it's on the way to Ascension Island or not. But they only do this once every three years or once every four years. So not every turtle does this and, and you don't know. And if you attach your GPS to the wrong turtle, it will never go there. So that's why these uh, measurements are usually done in the in this the opposite direction. But you can still measure a lot. You can measure the main speed. You can measure the orientation, the uh, how often they change direction, uh, how quickly they go, etc. So, so these are wonderful data uh, which we use. Okay. All right, and then all of this in a flowing environment. So the Atlantic. Uh, uh, is flowing, is, is an ocean. And here you see ocean flow data from uh, ECHO 2 from NASA, which have been dramatically visualized, really cool. And so now we want to use these data as well. Okay. Then for our uh, domain around Ascension Island, uh, here for 2014, five months, we visualize a flow field uh, this little triangle in the middle is Ascension Island, and this would be the ocean flow field uh, at that time uh, in 2014. So these data are all available, it's wonderful. And so uh, so this is something we want to use as well. Okay. So how do we do this in our model then? Uh, we had this orientation on the magnetic field, but what do we do with the flow field? Well, the ocean flow field, I call this capital V, Okay, and I put this into the velocity term. So this is our macroscopic equation. VQ, DQ come from the von Mises, as we discussed. And I put additionally this V here in the flow, which means uh, turtle are transported by the Northern Atlantic currents, whatever they are. Okay. All right. Now, in addition to all this, Oh, do I have six minutes? Okay. In addition to all this, we uh, look at an agent-based model for sea turtles, where we model each turtle as a dot. And then you can also do a random walk uh, inside a moving medium following all those dots. Okay. And then we look at uh, that four type of movers. A, a drifter has no active movement. It's just turned around by the uh, flow field of the ocean. A random mover is swimming, but has no orientational clue whatsoever, plus ocean drift. A weak navigator has some information about the geomagnetic field, but only weakly. So it has a large variance, is, is not certain where to go. It only roughly knows where to go. And then strong navigators, uh, they follow Q with a small variance, so they, they know exactly where to go. They're always right on target. Okay, so these are four scenarios uh, which we look at. And so then this is what typical simulations look like. Um, in the background, you see the flow field for several days, zero days, 15, 30, up to 150 days. And then the white dots are uh, simulated turtles in this flow field. And in this case, it's the weak navigators so you see that uh, they kind of tend towards Ascension Island, but then they're drifting away a bit, but then they seem to come back and most of them seems to, seem to make it. So that's the individual-based model. Uh, how does the PDE look like? We wanted to solve the PDE. Well, the PDE solution is a, is a cloud of probability. It should give you high probability here and low probability there. And I show this right here. Okay, so these are solutions of the PDE. Um, dark blue is high probability, yellow is uh, low probability. And you also can see that, that a, a large fraction of turtles make it to the target. Now, what I really like to do is to jump back and forth between those, uh, uh, between those simulations because you see how wonderfully this overlaps, the cloud of the PDE and the dots of the individual based model, right? This fits perfectly. And, and I think this is an interesting message, how individual-based models and PDE simulations uh, 
belong together, right? So the PDE shows you the highest probability to find a random walker, and then the uh, individual risk models follows these random walkers, and of course, there's the highest probability to find them right here. So this is how this fits together. Okay. Yeah, now I have like three more minutes. So let's look at the four cases, the drifters, the uh, the weak navigators, the strong navigators, see how they do. So the drifters have no idea about any direction. They're just drifting about. So this is Alexandra and Negar in her little boat. What happened? Something happened here on my thing. Okay, good. All right, so this is Alexandra and Negar drifting about, never making it to the island. Or, uh, let's go back. Now the random mover um, still has no sense of orientation, but they swim. They swim just randomly about. So the cloud is wider, they're spread out more, but they still are not successful and they're drift, drifting out to the left. Then we have the weak navigator. Um, and now this is gets interesting. So they, they're not quite sure, they have a rough idea where to go. Yeah, but look at this, they're doing really, really well. Okay, so many of the turtles have already found the island. Now some are drifted away, um, but then many of them come back and uh, and they find it again. So, so weak navigation seems to be already a rather good strategy. Yeah, and then the strong navigators uh, they of course directly to the island. They know exactly what's going on. So this would be like a, a modern boat with a modern GPS orientation. Okay. So from these, we can uh, from the individual based model, we can also look at individual path of uh, turtles. So yellow are the drifters. Right, White, we saw this. They're just drifting about. Red is a weak navigator. They eventually find the island, but they make long detours um, and they might miss it or might come back. And the strong navigator, they just uh, take almost the shortest way to get there. Yeah, all right. So let's compare this then with the biology again. So here I plot K, which is the concentration parameter of the von Mises distribution. And S is the speed. And uh, I want would like to add, oh yeah. And and now we plot the uh, success percentage. So blue means uh, about 100% of turtle find the island. Uh, no, do not, failure. So blue means that uh, most of them do not find the island. Yellow means most of them do find the island as success. And then here are intermediate values where maybe 70% or so make it to the island. And we wanted to know what is the realistic range of parameters for the orientation k. So this k was the k of the von Mises, okay? And for geomagnetic information, I, I've shown you this experiment in the cage where turtle uh, orientation is measured. So we can measure the k for the turtle. And the speed, of course, we can easily measure, right? We can just follow some of the turtles and measure the speeds. Um, these are two pictures, northwest. So here we release the turtles in the northwest and here in the southeast, which are a bit different because the stream of the Atlantic is a little bit different there. Okay, so where are the uh, realistic numbers for sea turtles? And they're right here. So within the red circle, this is the range. Uh, this is a biological range. This is the range of speed, which you see at sea turtles and the ability to orient themselves, the K, uh, is right here. And this is super interesting. It's right on the boundary between success and failure. So it, it seems to be rather than efficient. So uh, it's not required that every turtle makes it, but but maybe 50% or maybe 70% of turtles make it. That's just good enough to keep the populations alive, for sure. Also, if it would be up here in the yellow region, this, this looks like lots of energy would be uh, uh, wasted, right? There, there would have more information than they really need. So it seems to be optimized in some sense. So it's just good enough for most of the turtles to make it, uh, but it is not over precise. Um, uh, so yeah, that's really cool. All right. Okay, so what does this mean then for um, 
uh, for the Vermeer's distribution again. Well, a weak navigator K is one, this is a distribution. For a strong navigator K is three, this is a distribution. And, and either way, even for the strong, this is a widespread, right? This is not like ballistic where you zoom in into a target. This has a big variance and you can choose the wrong direction many times and, and only over many, many choices, you eventually then find the right direction or even weak navigation, right? This is not a strong orientation, not at all. You can even go in the opposite direction with certain probability. That's all fine. So, so this makes it very plausible in the uh, turtle case, because as I said, they have an organ which can measure magnetic fields, but this cannot be super precise, right? This is, is probably not very super precise, but it's precise enough uh, to, to make this journey. Okay, so right on the dot. No, I'm two minutes over anyways. Um, so a weak navigational ability is sufficient for most sea turtles to find Ascension Island. Other cues become relevant as turtles get closer. So seabed, tomography, chemical cues, other sea species, and so on. Uh, the Q contribution is that uh, directional information Q uh, can be used and we compute VQ and DQ. And then this is applicable, as I said, to uh, many other uh, things as well. But of course, in particular, nice is that we can answer Charles Darwin's question. Uh, how is it possible for most sea turtles to actually find the island? And I think this is a very convincing argument right here. Good. Okay, then I finish. And then I finish on this one. Do you want to ask any questions? No, nope, nobody there. Okay. So then, uh, yeah, then I, I really encourage you to show up on Friday to uh, Dr. Rode's talk. It will be really nice to have a good audience.